on Nationwide this evening, we're in Boris in County Carlow for the Festival of Writing and Ideas. We meet some of those taking part. We also join a group who are taking to the paths into the hills as part of the Carlow Walking Festival, which is attracting walkers from across the country. Plus, we find out all about the local arts festival, which is going from strength to strength. Hello, you're welcome to Nationwide. Well, our summer festivals are back and we can look forward to the Tullamore Show, the National Ploughing Championships, the Galway Races, Electric Picnic and many more. And you know what? Each county has its own lineup of festivals. And so we're here in County Carlo where they have a rake of back-to-back -back festivals. Here at the Boris Festival of Writing and Ideas. The festival is in its 10th year and it's where you can sit down and listen to topical conversations with newsmakers, writers and really interesting people who have something to say. All in this beautiful setting in County Carlo. We use the stars in the sky as our map. Well, Channel 4 International News Editor Lindsay Hilsom is on stage right now talking with others about her experiences in Ukraine. The Russians have a never-ending supply of artillery shells. They just have so much. And they don't care. I mean, you know, in a normal war, what do you do? You fire artillery to soften up an area, then you go in, you know, and take it. They know now they can't do that, so they will just destroy it. Like they've destroyed Mariupol. They just destroy it because it's about territory. They want the territory. They don't, you know, they don't care about liberating the people. All that stuff has gone now. It's just wanting the territory. Lindsay Hilsom, uh, in terms of the way you view Ukraine and the ongoing war there, are we in for a long, grinding, attritional war which will go on and on? What I fear more than anything is that the Russians are not going to give up and nor are the Ukrainians now, because they're not going to surrender and they don't want their country to be occupied. And, you know, if the West gives Ukraine more weapons, then they're going to be in a stronger position if it comes to some kind of diplomatic solution, which President Zelensky says it will in the end. And if the West doesn't do that, then what's going to happen? The Russians are going to roll all over them and occupy the country, which the Ukrainians are not going to accept. We're seeing this night after night now. Russian artillery strikes on apartment blocks in the suburbs of Kyiv. This is not an accident. It's a tactic designed to drive as many people out of the capital as possible. I fear what we're in for is this long attritional war in the east with heavy artillery from both sides. And these towns, Kramatorsk, Slovyansk, they're not the most beautiful towns in the world, but oh my God, like Mariupol, they are just going to be destroyed and human life destroyed as well. That's what I fear. Well, one of the things I feel guilty about is not having gone back to Afghanistan because I've been in Ukraine. And I hope I am going to go back very, very soon within the next month because I was there twice last year. And yes, in May, before the Taliban takeover, you know, I, I was going and looking at projects. I met a wonderful female MP called Farzana Kochi, who was from the Kochi people. Like any MP, it's Farzana Kochi's job to meet her constituents and try to solve their problems. She didn't dress in this burqa, this blue thing or this black stuff. No, she dressed in Kochi clothes. You know what those are? They're the most colorful clothes that you will ever see. You know, with embroidery and mirrors and, you know, yellow sleeves and a red skirt and a headscarf. Yes, she's a Muslim. And there she was doing everything she could for her people. And I met the elders of her community, old men. They said she's like a daughter to us. But she, I said, did you vote for her, a woman? They said, oh, yes, we voted for her because she comes to see us. She cares about us. And then when I went back in September after the Taliban takeover, well, Farzana was in hiding and eventually she escaped, thank God. And she sent me a picture of how she had escaped and she's wearing black to here and all you can see are her eyes. 
And now Farzana is, she's a refugee in Norway. She's in a small fishing town, seven hours from Oslo. Well, at least she's safe and she's with her sister and her sister's children. But her family, the wider family, has been fractured. And all she wants to do is help the Kochi people. And she can't. She can't because the Taliban won't let women be members of parliament and they won't let girls go to school. We're at the bridge leading into Erpin. There's been some incoming fire, not clear where exactly it's landed. And we just heard outgoing before that. You, you can't go and cover a war without there being risk, of course. But I'm, I'm not the bravest. I'm not the, you know, I know others who, who do much more frontline stuff than I do. And my days of embedding with troops are over. Um, and sometimes the best stories are behind the front line. The physical destruction caused by six years of war is pretty shocking. The destruction of people's lives even more so. Sometimes the best stories are the people who talk to you, who are not there right on the front line being shelled at that moment. Because at that moment, sometimes that's all you can get is the horror of war. It's important to get the horror of war, but you know, it's also important to get what people feel and think. And so, yes, you have to take some risks, but we try and calculate the risk. That if you don't, if you don't sometimes cry about the things that you see and the stories that you hear, then you're not a human being. And if you're not a human being, you shouldn't be a journalist because you'll be a lousy journalist because the only reason to do this is because you care. But then you also have to have some balance in your life and you have to try and do that as much as possible. And so coming to a place like uh, Boris for the Festival of Writing and Ideas, is that um, recreation for you? Is it the opportunity to switch off? And can you do that easily? I love coming here. I love this festival. This is the second time I've been to it. It's a very small, friendly festival. And it's not a posh festival. And you, you, know, you know you're going to have to walk through the mud. And the most brilliant minds are here. So it's this incredible opportunity for me to talk to these people and to listen to what they have to, to say and so on. So for me, to be honest, this is, this is heaven. Thank you very much. Thank you. The director of the Boris Festival is Hugo Mellet. Hugo, the Boris Festival of Writing and Ideas is back to its pre-pandemic format. How do you manage to draw such impressive lineup of writers and contributors here? We, we started um, as two amateurs in, in, um, in, in 2010 and not really knowing what we were doing. And, um, and we asked some people and they came down and they had a really nice time and they told their friends. In a way, it's the antithesis of so many of these events where artists come, they appear on stage, they sign some copies of their books and then they're off and away in a car. We decided to approach it slightly differently and make everyone come and stay in, in the village of Boris for a weekend and almost not let them leave. All writers kind of want to be musicians. Oh, is that right? <laughs> and all musicians kind of want to be writers. So, you know, once, you, once you've got a couple of, of writers with you, it is quite easy to get some musicians to come and join them and then those musicians, some other writers might like them and on it goes. And we'll be coming back to the Boris Festival later in the programme with a real treat. Musician and broadcaster Fiekna O'Brien on chatting and jamming with John Ilsley of Dire Straits. But first to another of our Carlo festivals, which you've been covering over the last couple of weeks. Niall Martin has been out with the Carlo Walking Festival, finding out a little bit about nature photography. This is an area I'd never walked in before. Carlo Tourism has based two walking festivals with guided walks around the county. But the routes are there for anyone to trek 365 days a year. Carlo Tourism uh, and the county, they organised uh, a walking festival. They have done it for a number of years. Uh, this year uh, they decided to have two walking festivals, one in the summer and one in the winter, which is around September, October. So as part of both of them, they have a range of walks that happen during the day and some night walks where they take advantage of the beautiful scenery and themes. So it could be photography, it could be t nature talks with a celebrity like Aina Di Lawa, or it could be just to experience the forests and the walks. 
Richard Smith from the Carlo Photographic Society is going to share some tips about getting good photos in the outdoors with a camera or mobile phone. Um, the idea is to walk a little bit and to stop every now and again. The start is a little bit steep, we'll take a stop and then we'll move again and then ask questions as you go along. Today's walk is a five kilometre loop around Quilch's Kilbranish Forest, with a shorter three kilometre route available too. I joined the Carlo Photographic Society back in 2008, one of the best things I ever did, and uh, it's the Camera Club in Carlo. And I've been a member since. We meet from um, September to May, and we do outings and competitions, and we learn from each other. So my day job is pushing a pen and uh, Totting up figures, so that's that's what I do for the daytime. I'm uh, retiring a little bit on that, so I might have more time now for photography. But really enjoy it, and I love the challenge of seeing what's in the camera when I go back. As the trail rises, the hypnotic wind turbines come into sight. On the right-hand side, we have the wind farm and we have four um, windmills actually working and today is nice and windy and it's a beautiful shot with the blue sky in the background and we have nice clouds to match and also fantastic green color this time of the year so great opportunities to take landscape shots some people think they're dead ugly others think they actually add a beauty to the landscape it depends how you uh, frame them. For example, if I stop here and I see that, that windmill through the, through the trees, it actually makes a nice photograph. It's all very well taking a photo of something that's just standing there, but how about a fast-moving target like butterflies? Two, two here, look. That's an extremely difficult one to get because it's moving so fast and because the subject is so small. If that is a full-size butterfly, you'd have some chance of getting it. Now, if you have a camera that has uh, speed uh, setting on it, it follows the thing that's moving, like a car or a person or a bike, and you, you, you take shots like... And out of those 10, 15 shots, you might get one or two. And then you crop it afterwards. So, like, we're on a beautiful sunny day yes. here today, and, you know, the light right now on you looks quite harsh. Yes. So how do you deal with sort of light and shade? Well, if you're trying to take people, or uh, maybe even animals, uh, I'm in the full sun at the moment, and it's quite harsh, and it's very different for group photographs, for weddings and functions like that. But if we just walk in, out of the sun, all of a sudden the full face can now be photographed very well. And I look probably a lot younger than I did a few minutes ago. <laughs> the real good one is you stand with your back to the sun and you come over here and you take the shot with me looking at you. I'm not squinting at all now. The sun is behind me and if you have a flash on your camera, you turn your flash on, you take the shot with your flash. So the flash lights my, my face up and the sun stays where it is in the back. The whole idea of, of, of a good image is one that looks natural, it's not contrived. Composition is, is, is probably the fun part of photography. Well, we've had a lovely day. Thank it's you. just the weather couldn't have been better. Yes. We've got kind of the light and the shade. Yes. We've got kind of the people, the landscape and uh, the wildlife along the way. Yes. It's been a lovely day. Thank you for coming and thank you for coming to Carlo and do come again. The walk we took was one of 18 guided walks during the Carlo Walking Festival and the good news is there'll be another festival coming along later in the year. We're going to take a break now but when we come back we'll have some circus performances like you've never seen before. We'll see you shortly. You're welcome back to Nationwide. We are in County Carlow taking a look at three different festivals which have taken place over the weekend. Among them, the Carlow Arts Festival. Niall Martin had a look and saw what was in store. You could watch Dara McLaughlin's circus artists perform for hours. No, you really can. Their show, for as long as we are here, lasts up to four hours. 
This work is a very unique work for me because everything I've done before was a written show for the theatre stage. And this work is designed to be an experience for us as much as for the audience. The closer you look, the more you'll see. So if you just come in and go, oh look, they're very skillful people. Great, lovely, next. But if you stay with them, you'll notice the little movements of the wrist while they're doing the handstands, the breath, the maybe the sigh they, uh, as they let out breath when they get up because they're just starting to be exhausted. Or all these little details become a thing in themselves. Dara, originally from Clonakilty, now lives in Berlin and tours with a group of dedicated artists not afraid to test their bodies to the limit. It can be quite stressful and a lot of pain can emerge as the time goes on, but we, we talk about, um, yeah, we're aiming for more the qualities of perseverance than suffering. We don't want people to just look at us torturing ourselves, but we want to look at people overcoming something and hopefully be inspired by, by that and uh, to see something very human in it, because often circus is depicted as something almost heroic, you know, a, a skillful action no one else could do. I think it's a lot like marathon running. You know, you feel like you can't go, but then you suddenly get this last burst of energy. The Carlo Arts Festival was back with a bang in real life at the weekend. We are super happy to celebrate togetherness again and being all together. This year's program is a truly uh, eclectic mix of circus, theatre, dance, visual art, music, a lot of music. We are lucky and very happy to partner with Carlo Live and Local. They are on their third edition and as part of the festival this year, they have um, settled a wonderful lineup of local artists from Carlo, musicians and singers, including Shane Hennessy, Jenny, Jerry Fish and many others, daytime, nighttime. Ye Vagabonds are from Carlo and they are performing on Sunday night at Visual on stage. Four new plays will be staged in this compact new art space called The Shed. I'm Sinead and I'm from Bagelstown and Carlo and this is Jed Murray, Killian O'Donica and Ray Scannell. The maximum audience capacity in The Shed is one. You're not going to make that bit much profit. Bit of a surprise. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, it's not a money-making show. It's more of an art for the for the art show. So tell us a little bit about the plays that are going to be performed here for the audience of one. So there's four. They're they're similar but different. Um, the kind of an overarching theme of the sky or the world above our heads. If you could reach over the side, you could see a reflection in the water. How difficult is it to just make a basic living in Ireland if you're working in the arts? Very. <laughs> Short answer. It's a, it's a juggling act. Everybody has two, three, four different jobs and you just have to try to manage as best you can to make the work and still feed yourself. The government is going to experiment with this idea of kind of a living basic wage for artists. Um, is that something that you kind of uh, welcome if it was not done on a national basis? Yeah, I think it'll be great. Um, it would give, for artists, it would definitely give, I think, just a bit of breathing space so you could work um, on your ideas and not have to worry about your rent and if you're going to turn on the heating today or um, when the next meal is coming from, you could have, just have a little bit of space so that you can dedicate your energy to the art and what you're making. Why do you do it? Because oh, I love it. <laughs> Ruined from a young age. <laughs> played, played Mary in the first nativity play in primary school and that was hooked. <laughs> Local children too got in on the act with five schools working on a puppet making and performance piece. This fifth class have made a beautiful puppet called Propella. <laughs> beautiful <laughs> giant flying worm. Propella is going to walk through the streets of Carlo on the 11th of June as part of a larger carnival and parade. We've been working with five schools. There's Rathvilly, Hackettstown. We've got two schools in Carlowtown. This is the Educate Together and St. Felix National School. And we've also got Michael. The hair is fabulous. Uh, gorgeous expanding foam uh, perm. The, the perm is back. <laughs> carefully, carefully. Was it hot in there? Well, Very hot. Yeah, it's hot, but... It's fun to be in it, but we don't have the eye holes yet, so we need to... So we a, can't see. Yeah. That's why we need two yeah. 
It's been actually really, really fun and cool because it's just, I, I like building and I think all my classmates do as well, so it's actually really fun for us. Yeah. Hours later, Dara McLaughlin and his circus performers were staying focused. The part of the act is to observe the artist's travails as they use their mental and physical strength to keep the show in the air. Some of the best places we performed were where uh, audience would come in the beginning, stay with us for half an hour, then we'd go see another show, go for lunch, and then come back again and stay, stay the last hour with us and just see what happened in that time and how much we've changed. We want people to enter into this and witness this sort of journey we're going on. And we hope that everyone had a lovely weekend at the Carlo Arts Festival. Well, we're back at the Festival of Writing and Ideas at Boris House. It's half past eight in the evening. And on stage is RTE presenter and member of the Hot House Flowers, Fiekna O'Brenon, with John Ilsley from Dire Straits. OK, now we've, we've we played this twice together, first time um, Ever. That's the first time you've played it, isn't it? Listen, the well, last two weeks I've been sitting in my studio at home with YouTube tutorial oh, videos of how the hell do you play Romeo and Juliet? I mean, Mark Knopfler, he's a guitar genius, I'm not. <laughs> so I'm going to give it a, yes, a ham-fisted approximation. But also, I'm a bass player, so you've got to f <laughs> you have to, have to forgive me if I make it the odd... Um, um... I mean, what, a, what a beautiful song. What so beautiful if song. I start it and then you just you join in when you feel like it and then we'll... Okay, okay all right, okay. Man. Thank you very much. What a song. <laughs>